Good morning and welcome to ELSO Advisor webinar, Managing Cover Crops for a Modern Production System, brought to you by the Illinois Soybean Checkoff. I'm Todd Steinacher, Content Coordinator for ELSO Advisor, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us this morning and have a few housekeeping items to begin with. If you included your CCA number when you registered for this webinar and you stay with us for the entire presentation, your number will automatically be submitted for one CEU in soil and water management at the conclusion of this webinar. If you are listening to the recording of this webinar, you will need to go to Certified Crop Advisor website, log into your account, and self-report for credits. You can ask questions during the webinar by using the tool panel at the bottom of your screen, and we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Joel Groover. Dr. Groover is an Associate Professor of Soil Science and Sustainable Ag Agriculture at Western Illinois University, where he also conducts research in conservation cropping systems, soil organic matter, and the use of cover crops in organic grain production. Joel earned his PhD in soil science from Northern, North Carolina State University in Raleigh and is currently the director of the WIU Organic Research Program. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Gruber. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Todd. I have no, no idea how many people are listening in, but welcome to everyone and Todd or um, Jill or anyone, if you notice there's some problem, if you're not hearing well or the slides are not working, please let me know. Don't let me keep going if there are any problems. So I was just thinking about how to start this presentation and I was reminiscing a little bit about 10 years ago, we had a, a great conference, um, Effective Cover Cropping in the Midwest. and um, this was based here in Illinois. You can actually look up these presentations. Um, the, the meeting was in Decatur, Illinois. And I guess the point is that 10 years ago, cover crops were already a hot topic, but we, we have come a long way. And so one of the things I want to review at the start of this presentation is just um, where, where things have, have uh, gone in the last 10 years. I guess a key place to start is just what, what are the pressing issues? You know, what, why should we be taking cover crops more seriously? I think, you know, if you're on this, on this webinar, then probably you uh, already have some, some reasons in your mind, but uh, there's certainly still some resistance to planting cover crops. Cover crops are not um, a dominant practice in Illinois. So let's just think about some of the reasons to, uh, to plant cover crops. Pretty sure that you're all familiar with the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy and um, the rather lofty goals of 45% reduction in total nitrogen and phosphorus by 2035. But we also have some interim goals that are coming up real soon 15% uh, reduction in nitrate, 25% reduction in total phosphorus by 2025. So, a critical question is. How are we doing? Are we moving towards those goals? Are we gonna make it by 2025? Well, actually we're not doing that well. Uh, this, this was some data that came out last year and the reality is the, the goals with the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy are all based on a baseline, what our average production was in terms of nitrates and phosphorus released into the Mississippi watershed back in the 1980 to 1996, 1996 timeframe. And obviously we've made all sorts of progress in terms of technology and agriculture. But when you take a look at the, the measurements of nitrate loads and phosphorus loads, we actually have increased about 7% for nitrate 26% for phosphorus. Remember that our goals are 45% reduction. But 
you know, that that's thinking about things on a very macro scale, a scale that, you know, it's kind of hard to put your fingers on. We can think much more locally about what's coming out of our, our tile outlets. And some of you may be involved with this type of monitoring. There was a monitoring project not too far from here. And this is just a little bit of data to uh, give you some perspective. Um, we were measuring nitrate and also phosphorus in tile water. And remember the EPA goal is to have our nitrate levels below 10 parts per million. 20 parts per million though is, uh, I guess I would say a more kind of standard level that we typically see coming out of our tile outlets. So about twice the EPA standard. And what you can see here is that there were a lot of data points that were well above that 20 parts per million. That 20 parts per million is considered to be kind of, if you are doing everything well in terms of good nutrient management, the idea is that we should not be much above 20 parts per million. The reality is that the farmers that were particip participating in this program, they were conservationists. They were farmers that wanted to be in this program because they were interested in really doing their best to take care of water quality. And so you can see that we have a challenge. Under good management, we still have many of our tile outlets delivering water that's well above the 10 parts per million and even 20 parts per million. Sometimes we think, well, you know, the issue isn't just agriculture. You know, there are other sources of nutrients that we need to think about. Well, the reality is while, yes, there are other sources, the point sources have shown some clear reductions. Since 2011, we've seen a 14% reduction in nitrogen losses. We've also seen a 22% reduction in phosphorus losses. So the point sources, while these reductions have come at great cost to improve our water treatment, or sorry, our sewage treatment uh, systems, that's the main um, type of point source, um, they, they have been making progress, whereas the progress is harder to find in terms of agricultural nutrient loss. The story is bigger than nutrients though. We also need to think about soil health and soil erosion. Some of you may be familiar with the Illinois Conservation Transect Survey Typically every other year, there are many data points in every county, hundreds of data points in every county where um, we have um, basically a rating of um, how much soil loss is occurring. And just to uh, be very quick about this, the, the basic idea is they identify using the universal soil loss equation, whether the soil loss is projected to be less than T, which is a kind of a established tolerable level. And then they also look at whether it would be one to two T or even greater than two T. The unfortunate situation is that these numbers actually are not getting better. The transect survey is being done in the same way every other year. It's, you know, it's not perfect. It's a drive-by situation. They're using a computer model, but the reality is that using the same approach, we're actually seeing more fields with soil loss predicted to be greater than T. And whenever we are greater than T, obviously there's a particular need for cover crops or other conservation practices, but even, even losing soil at T, which for most central Illinois soils would be five tons per acre, that's, that's still a situation that really is not ideal in the long run. N another thing that uh, gave me pause as I thought about some of the challenges, we, we have lost some of our experts in the last decade. But one of the leading experts in Illinois was Mike Plummer. And he was giving an incredible number of presentations on cover, cover crops um, 10 years ago. And um, he passed away now about four years ago, and it, his expertise was really unparalleled. So I just want to uh, take.
take a moment to remember Mike Plummer. Some of his presentations are still available online. I looked at a couple last night. So if you uh, do a search for Mike Plummer, you can find some of his great work. Um, he worked uh, particularly extensively down in Southern Illinois. His legacy lives on in terms of the many farmers that he impacted. Here we can see Terry Taylor, who did collaborative research with Mike Plummer for years. And um, the long-term impact on farms like the Taylor farm is really clear, long-term impact of cover crops. Um, and 2012 was a kind of a turning point for cover crops in, in Illinois. It was a year that obviously um, we experienced severe drought, and so soils that had more water holding capacity um, were, were quite obvious. And so Terry saw that where he had long-term no-till and cover crops, his, his corn was much less uh, damaged by drought. Um, but we also, in 2012, had um, a lot of nutrients left in our soil that weren't taken up by corn. And so farmers were particularly eager to get cover crops planted. And then with the opportunity to plant cover crops early and good moisture in the fall of 2012. Actually, 2012 was a major turning point in terms of increasing cover crop use in Illinois. Over the last decade, we've had a lot of farmers that maybe had dabbled a little bit in cover crops, but now um, they started taking cover crops seriously. They started using their technology, their um, innovative approach to agriculture to make cover crops work. And so, some of these interesting success stories are described in a publication called High Yield Conservation. Um, th these are relatively short stories, not a whole lot of detail, but they are interesting to see. So uh, if, if you'd like to, to read about um, how some of the larger scale, you know, high tech, um, sophisticated farmers in Illinois and across the Midwest have integrated cover crops, you might want to check out these stories. But I think really we need to dig deeper. We need to look beyond just a, you know, a one page story that, um, you know, many, many of those stories in high yield conservation also, um, since they were funded by the Buffett Foundation, they also ended up in mainstream farm publications. And so they kind of wet our appetite, but they didn't really explain how cover crops were being used. They were just too short. Um, for longer format discussions of cover, crop, cover crops, we can uh, look at publications like the No-Till Farmer magazine. Um, they have a, every issue has um, an article in the What I've Learned from No-Tilling series. And so some of these are, are very uh, detailed discussions of how farmers have integrated cover crops. Um, one farmer that's particularly uh, well known in, in this area is Steve Berger. And um, he's been using cover crops very intensively on top of long-term no-till for over two decades. An even more detailed discussion um, that I found quite valuable was this cover crop calendar that was put together. And this actually goes all the way back to 2012. But um, basically, rather than just a, you know, a, a write up of what Steve was doing, they, the uh, author went to the burger farm throughout the entire year and took more than 40 photos showing the basically the um, the step by step uh, processes that the burgers were using to make cover crops work. So it was more than more than just how they got them planted and terminated, but really how it how cover crops fit into an entire cropping system throughout the year. Steve Berger is someone who has been um, particularly innovative in figuring out how to plant effectively into cover crops. He he plants um, most years the entire farm, two thousand acres to cereal rye and he plants corn into that cereal rye. We'll discuss um, that challenge a little more in just a second, but um, this is just an example of 
information from a presentation that Steve Berger shared about specifically how he sets up his planter to effectively plant into cover crops. And these are the types of details that are critically important. We need to go beyond the, you know, the feel good story and understand the nuts and bolts of how do we effectively establish a crop into cover crops. And Steve does a great job of discussing that. These are just some of the specifics that he focuses on. As, as I was just mentioning, he focuses on setting up his planter effectively. Um, if he is planting corn into cereal rye, he needs to manage his nitrogen specifically. Nitrogen being applied for uh, the cover crop to have a lower CN ratio. So he's fertilizing the cover crop to change the quality of the cover crop residues, but then he's also putting on nitrogen with the planter and he's also side dressing nitrogen. So the, the overall approach to nitrogen is changing so that he can make corn grow effectively in cereal rye. He has to manage insects more intensively. That's something that he has thought a lot about and he has to think about his time management differently. So um, once again, if you want some of the specifics about Steve Berger, you can just do a Google search and you'll find many presentations online. Steve is one of many farmers in Iowa that have collaborated together as part of the Practical Farmers of Iowa Cooperators Program. And they've put together great, you know, great, very hands-on practical information about how to manage cover crops. This slide here is a screen capture from a great presentation that's it's all based on farmer led research, figuring out basically the seven key concerns to make cover crops work. And I, I won't read through all of these right now, but some, some of these things are basically the, the key issues. If you look at a farmer that hasn't been having success with cover crop, you could almost always identify that it's one of these seven things that um, we're you know, we're not being done effectively. Another thing that PFI has put together that's I think very, uh, very useful is this cover crop decision tree. And so basically it just walks you through step-by-step step what you need to think about in terms of timing, in terms of what the following crop is, in terms of um, those types of details that, um, lead to the seven issues on the previous slide. Basically, if you follow through this key, it will really help you figure out how to reduce your, your risk and increase your likelihood of success. Uh, they've also put together specific bulletins, all based on you know, farmer experience on how to address some of the key challenges, such as how do you plant corn into cereal rye? Obviously, a key question is, how do you terminate the rye? How do you supply the nitrogen? How do you deal with um, potential disease issues? All of those disease and insect issues, all of those are addressed um, in detail, very farmer accessible information that was developed by farmers in this particular publication from Practical Farmers of Iowa. Iowa also is blessed to have a, a, a very valuable um, strip trial database. The Iowa Soybean Association um, has their on-farm network that actually has just been renamed. I'm not sure I can remember the exact new name, but in the, in the last year, the on-farm network um, was renamed, but you could still go into their database and basically you can look at all sorts of on-farm trial data. And of course, some of that data is related to cover crops. One of the things that jumps out if you look at that data is there are very few negative effects of cover crops on soybeans. Most of the soybean effects are either neutral or positive. When you look at cover crops ahead of corn, if we're talking about a cereal grain like rye, then there, there are a significant number of negative effects. Why is that? Well, Basically, if you dig into this data, you can see that normally the issue is related to two things, either nutrient immobilization, normally nitrogen immobilization, or root health. And so that's something that we will 
think about in a little more detail in just a minute. But um, th this is the kind of database that's it's all on farm work. So it's being done at farm scale and it helps us. Basically, it helps us drill in on what are the key issues. So I encourage you to take a look at the um, on farm network strip trial database. Shifting across the river to Illinois, I think Illinois also has some um, very interesting things going on. One of our um, showcase programs that um, is now about five years old is the Precision Conservation Management Program. Um, and this is basically a program of the Illinois Corn Growers Association. The thing that makes this program unique is how it focuses specifically on looking at both conservation and profitability at the same time. The goal is essentially to help farmers integrate their field management data with their financial data to understand how they can specifically adjust their management to improve environmental impact, but also improve their bottom line. This, this is a program that still is um, not real wide scale. Um, it's, it's only in 16 counties in Illinois, as well as a few counties in, in Kentucky, but it, um, it is on about a quarter million crop acres now. Let's read that comment there. I think this uh, summarizes pretty well what they are all about. We seek to enhance the effectiveness of conservation for the farm operation while helping reduce complexity and manage the risks associated with practices. One of the key pieces of PCM is it's not just a, an individual program that farmers enroll in, it's a collaboration between farmers and PCM specialists. So when you think about what, you know, I guess is kind of the foundational relationship for modern agriculture, it's the relationship between farmers and service providers. PCM has technical specialists. Each of them um, works with farmers in about three different counties. And this is just an example. Clay Bess is um, one, one of their um, most experienced specialists. And he was recognized last year for his success in working with farmers. But the, the basic idea is this program is kind of like Illinois Farm Business Farm Management. It helps you to basically benchmark how you are doing in terms of the effectiveness of your practices financially and also in terms of conservation. And it looks at both of those two things at the same time with, with the guidance of a specialist that helps you to enter your data into the program and then also to interpret the results. They have um, put together some summary presentations. So just, just like with Illinois Farm Business Farm Management, mo most of the information you're looking at is how you basically you have your own private financial information you get to see how you compare with other other producers but um, we also can take kind of the the broader perspective and look at some of these um, these case studies and so um, I took a look at this publication this morning that there is some discussion of the economics of cover crops, but it, I think it's a little preliminary, so I think I'll uh, hold off on that, um, but I encourage you know, on discussing that, but I encourage you to uh, to look into PCM, see whether you're in one of those 16 counties, and if if you are, it's a great opportunity to really get um, technical support in terms of how to implement your conservation practices and then monitor their financial impact on your business. We have a, an interesting um, second year program here in Illinois that um, my guess is that it's actually, um, the program is probably full by now. Um, the official deadline is tomorrow, January 15th, but this is a program where the, there's a limited amount of funding. So I'm guessing that the funds have already already been allocated, but this is a program in Illinois, similar to a, a program in Iowa, where you can get discounts on your, um, your crop insurance if you plant cover crops. So um, if you're interested in more, more details, you can contact the Illinois Department of Agriculture. Um, but basically you have to enroll by um, 
a certain date in uh, early in the year to get a reduction in your crop insurance premium. Thinking a little more broadly now, we were thinking about Iowa and Illinois. More broadly, we have a great resource called the Midwest Cover Crop Council, and they have essentially compiled all the extension bulletins as well as other resources for the entire Midwest region. And many, you know, many of the issues that we face in Illinois in terms of cover crops are also faced in other Midwest states. And so it's useful to have all this information compiled in one place. One of the um, valuable things that you can get to very quickly if you go to the MCCC website is a set of guidelines, or you could say recipes for how farmers that are new to cover crops might want to get started in the lowest risk type of, of approach. So here you can see the um, cover crop recipes, and they are available for essentially all of the Midwest states. Um, specifically for Illinois. If you are following corn going into soybeans, you have probably the lowest risk strategy of all, planting cereal rye into those corn stalks preceding soybeans. And I, I won't go into more detail right now, but it's it's spelled out in a very, um, you know, very accessible format and basically discusses the details of how how if you're getting started, this is probably the lowest risk approach to implement cover crops, following corn, preceding soybeans, drilling cereal rye into corn stalks. They also discuss some options for following soybeans. In this case, rather than using a winter hardy cover crop, it's probably better to start with a winter kill cover crop and maybe a mix like oats and radish these need to be planted earlier in the fall than cereal rye, and they will they will be killed by the winter, so they are are less likely to have any negative effect on your following corn crop. The Midwest Cover Crop Council website also has a useful tool, well, actually several different tools. But if you if you are interested in row crops, you would want to look at the row crop um, cover crop selector tool, and um, it's recently been revised, so the formatting is a little bit different, and um, you might want to take a look at the tutorial on how to use this tool. But the, the bottom line is that you, you start by identifying your location, so you actually pick out a particular county, and then you put in the, um, the window when you plan to plant and harvest your crop, and it will show you cover crops that basically give you opportunities either to plant before or after your cash crop or potentially overlap with your, with your cash crop. And you, you also can put in your specific objectives, what you're trying to accomplish and other risk factors such as drainage. And it will help you identify the, the cover crops that best fit your system. So that's kind of an overview um, of, I guess, the key developments over the last 10 years. We, we've had a lot of farmers adopt cover crops, but we also have the majority of Illinois farmers have not adopted cover crops. So we need to think about some of the, you know, the recipes for lower risk um, entry into cover crops. But now we're going to switch gears and think a little bit about the science, how things have developed in the last 10 years to help us think about how to move forward. One of the leading cover crop investigators in the Midwest what was at Illinois State, and he has moved on or moved back, I should say, to Purdue because that's where he did his PhD. Dr. Shalimar Armstrong um, was at Illinois State when he did this research, and now he's back at Purdue. But the, the bottom line is that this was a really innovative project where they looked at how do we take our, our standard nitrogen management program which would be in, you know, in central Illinois, the, you know, the dominant approach would be fall applied nitrogen, at least part of the nitrogen program. How do we take that system and fit cover crops into that? Potentially improve water quality and also maybe improve nitrogen availability to the corn crop. So that's what 
Shalimar looked at with, with graduate students. And the, the bottom line is they, they found that you could apply fall anhydrous or spring anhydrous into living or dead cover crops. And in both cases, you could have, if the cover crops were, were um, in that system, you could expect to have significant reductions in nitrates lost into uh, your tile water. So you could see with, with spring nitrogen and fall nitrogen, but in both of those cases, if there were living cover crops, that's what the green dots are showing, the nitrate load coming out of your, your tile water um, was significantly reduced, almost 50%. That was plot work. Um, one of the big breakthroughs that Shalimar has also brought to cover crop research is looking at watershed um, scale research. And so he actually did a project where they identified two paired watersheds and they were able to get a very high level of um, cover cropping in one of the watersheds. And they compared that to a, um, a very similar watershed where they had a very low level of cover cropping. And um, the, the bottom line is that this is quite different than just looking at the effect of cover crops on a particular field. This is looking at hundreds of fields all within a watershed. And what they, what they were able to show um, really for the first time was there is a clear effect of cover crops if you have the great majority of fields in a watershed planted to cover crops, you will see that early, um, er, earlier in the year, the effect is small, but basically as the, um, as the season goes on, the tile water benefit to having the cover crops gets larger and larger. And you start to see that where, the, where you have cover crops, you have substantially less nitrate being lost through the tiles. And so you could see in both cases, this is two different seasons, um, the, the green dots are showing where the cover crops were and the black dots are the tile water coming out of the tiles where there were no cover crops. One of the most recent um, projects that Shalimar has been working on is something he calls precision planted cover crops. And the, the basic idea here is that if you think about a, a drill, being used to establish the cover crops, they're planting two rows and then they're skipping two rows, planting two rows, skipping two rows. So the, these rows are seven and a half inches apart. And essentially what they're doing is they are using half as much cover crop seed. So they're keeping the, the full, they're keeping the standard rate for the drill, except they are blocking off half of the rows. And so they're using less cover crop seed and they're leaving a zone where you will not have um, the interference that you might get if you were planting into, into that cover crop. And what they found is that um, it, it reduces nitrogen immobilization by the cover crop. It gives you faster warm up in your cash crop growing zone and um, it reduces your cost of cover cropping. And I guess the other, key thing, maybe most interesting, is um, the cover crops are very responsive to having that extra space. And so you, with half as much seed, you can actually grow an equivalent amount of biomass to drilling every row. And you can accumulate an equivalent amount of nitrogen in the rye with only growing half as many rows. So very interesting work. Um, basically ways that we can use less seed to get double the bang for our buck. Another interesting um, research project, this, this was done, this work was done primarily in Iowa, was looking at what's really going on when we plant corn into cereal rye. But where, where, where does the negative effect come from? And the, these negative effects are not consistent. The, the work done by um, done by these researchers shows that it's really only about a half or third of the time that there's any negative effect when we plant corn into rye. When we have cold, wet seasons or cold, wet springs, and we have dead cover crop residue on the surface, that's when we are likely to see this negative effect. And 
what they identified here was that be, beyond nitrogen, with nitrogen you know, being supplied so that it's not a factor, the main other issue is seedling disease and specifically pythium is the biggest concern. And this particular research project looked at, well, what can we do to address that pythium risk? And they found that some seed, fungic seed applied fungicides um, had no effect and other ones actually were um, effective at addressing this, this risk. And so um, they specifically found that if the active ingredient uh, metal axle was included as a, a seed treatment, they could substantially reduce sorry, reduce the risk of pythium disease to the corn seedlings planted into rye. So this is just a, an example of looking at, you know, what what is the challenge and how do we manage it? Um, they identified a specific approach using a um, active ingredient metal axle on the seed address this concern. I was involved with the project now about 10 years ago where we also looked at the effect of cover crops on um, cash crop health. In this case, we were focusing, focusing in on soybeans and we found some interesting results. This was a study that was done across um, three different locations, research stations and also on farm. So six, six total locations um, looking at a range of cover crops and how they impacted soybean health. What we found was that both Cereal rye and rapeseed improved soybean stands. It also reduced um, the incidence of both rhizoctonia and fusarium. And in specific cases where rhizoctonia was a problem, we saw that cereal rye preceding soybeans um, was giving a consistent increase in yield. So once again, we, we have a specific um, set of pathogens that are the issue and specific cover crops that can help us to address those pathogens. This isn't an effect that we see all the time, but it's an, it is an effect that um, is, you know, is one of those finer details that when we drill into how cover crops work um, in our soybean systems, we see that we can have some beneficial effects in terms of disease management. Cover crop roots also change the physical properties of our soils. And this is some interesting work done in the, at the University of Maryland, where they looked at the effect of radish and cereal rye ahead of corn and also ahead of soybeans. And what they found was the, the most beneficial effect was actually radish um, consistently where radish was grown preceding preceding corn, they had a higher number of corn roots at depth. And there, the, it was a smaller effect on soybeans. Um, there was a, an even smaller effect where rye was planted and um, there was consistently less root density where there was no cover crop. In addition to the, this, this data is where they were actually counting roots. In addition to this, they also measured soil moisture at depth and they found consistently that when the um, preceding cover crop was radish, they found that more moisture was being extracted from the subsoil by both corn and soybeans. And so that was an indication that more roots were getting to depth and also were more effective at removing soil moisture. Let's think a little bit about radish because I think this is a cover crop that in the last decade has, uh, I guess, been maybe a little bit misunderstood. Um, radish is a cover crop that is very visually impressive, particularly when you have those giant radishes that maybe got planted really early or had um, lots of space around them. But those really are not what we need to make radishes effective in our fields. This was this was just a demonstration that you could see in this picture, but um, we we also have looked at this type of effect in the field, and we can see that after just a month and a half to two months, we typically have radish roots that are about three to four feet deep. We're not talking about the big storage tuber three to four feet deep. We're talking about fine radish roots that are actually creating pathways that the following cash crop roots 
can follow. And I think there's maybe some misunderstanding that we need to have giant radishes to impact our soils. Gi giant radishes actually um, sometimes can be problematic. You can create, cre you know, create problems by having that much um, biomass produced. If you plant radishes that are able to get to even half an inch in size, you typically have roots that have um, grown several feet deep and that, that can beneficially impact the following cash crop roots. Radishes are also really good at extracting phosphorus. So this is some interesting data also from the University of Maryland where they looked at impact of cover crops on soil test phosphorus. And they found that um, two, two different types of radishes had the most positive effect, basically boosted soil test phosphorus compared to control. So we're not talking about new phosphorus being applied. We're talking about phosphorus that's already in the soil being made more plant available by growing a radish cover crop. Another valuable aspect of radishes and legumes is that they release nutrients from their biomass very quickly. And this is a key concern when thinking about how to manage cover crop residues. We need to think about how the nutrient release is going to um, line up with the demand for nutrients from our following cash crop. And some of the negative effects that farmers have seen of cover crops on following cash crops are related to basically not managing the, the nutrient release effectively. Um, our cereal grains, basically there is long-term increase in nutrient supply from the soil, but particularly if you let the cereal grain get beyond the joint stage, you, you almost always see immobilization of nitrogen. So you'll need to have you, you'll need to have more nitrogen um, supplied um, in your nutrient program to compensate for that. If you add legumes into a mix with cereal rye, you can have a compensation. And obviously if you have just, just legumes or even just radishes or uh, other uh, species in that, in that family, you tend to have more nutrient availability. Some of the effects of cover crops go beyond specific um, effects like nutrient effects or physical property effects. Some of these broader effects we sometimes think of as just a general rotation effect. And so some of the most obvious rotation effects that um, have been identified in long-term research are the effects of taking our corn soybean systems or our continuous corn systems and adding in a third grain, adding in wheat, for example, or adding in a, a small grain. And obviously this is not this is not a standard practice in most of Illinois to have a small grain. But the, the research is really strong. It shows that while there may be limited revenue from selling that small grain, the impact on the yield of our corn and our soybeans can be so significant that it actually can compensate for less revenue from the small grain. Th this happens to be research that was done in Ontario, but si similar work has been done here in the United States. And the, you know, the, these are the, I guess, kind of the longer term issues that we need to think about. Small grains are not part of our systems, but when, you know, when they are included, they do create potential through kind of broad rotation effects to have higher yields of our corn and soybeans. One of the other things that small grains do is they create opportunities for planting more cover crops. For example, planting these types of complicated mixes that you see in this picture. Um, that, you know, this is not something that's being done by very many Illinois farmers simply because we don't grow very many small grains. But when you can harvest a small grain in midsummer, you have many more opportunities for planting cover crops. There are other opportunities that are created if you spread out your cash crop rows. This happens to be some work that I've been doing for this. This was our third year of looking at 
solar corridors where you actually skip a cash crop row and stick in a cover crop. Just like with the you know small grain situation, th these are not these are not the main opportunities available to Illinois farmers simply because most Illinois farmers are not are not ready to uh, take this approach. But the, the the bottom line is that there are ways that we can change our cropping systems to create more openings for cover crops. Let's say that you have created an opening. Whether that opening was created by a small grain or a solar corridor, or perhaps prevent plant situation. If you if you have an opening for planting cover crops earlier, you have an opening for using more complex mixtures. And so we need to think about how to assemble those mixtures. There hasn't been a whole lot of research on this, but Penn State has really led the way on um, identifying what the you know the best strategies are for putting together mixtures. This happens to be a, a useful bulletin on that topic. Um, but I think where I normally start is simply looking at a tool called the Smart Mix Calculator. This happens to be on a uh, commercial cover crop seed vendor's website, the, the Green Cover Seed website. But this is, you know, this is not something that you need to use just because you're a, a customer of Green Cover Seed. You don't need to buy their seed. You can simply use their tool to think about how to assemble a mix and use their prices if you want to look at the economics. But the, the bottom line is this is a great tool for putting in your location, putting in your specific objectives, and then it helps you figure out how to assemble not just a single species, but multiple species, how to put together that mix. Mixtures are complicated in terms of their effects. Um, that's where the Penn State work has really been groundbreaking in terms of looking at how we get um, compounding of effects. But th the bottom line is there, there is um, new research showing that basically when we put multiple species together, we can change how much nutrient access there is. We can increase uptake of nutrients by having more than one cover crop species. We can increase uptake of water by having more than one cover crop species. And so if you're interested in some of the underlying science, um, there is some, some good work out there. Okay, let me just quickly look at my time here. Um, I guess I need to wrap this up. Um, so I guess the key thing that you need to think about to identify how to make cover crops work in your situation is, what is your context? Or another way to say that is, what are the pieces in your puzzle that interact with cover crops? There are some pieces like if you have livestock, if you have highly erodible land, those are pieces that really facilitate effective use of cover crops. There are other pieces such as, let's say that you prefer to do corn on corn, you prefer to do fall tillage. Th those are pieces that you might have to think about how to adjust those pieces because those can interfere with effective cover cropping. A really important part of the context that I think is sometimes overlooked is the human context. Who are the people who might sell you seed, who might custom plant cover crops for you, might share on-farm experiences? might be the landlord that either wants you to plant cover crops or, or doesn't want you to. Um, that, that part of the human context for cover crops is very important. I think one of the big developments in the last 10 years is that we have more and more service providers, the people that provide technical support to farmers that are becoming familiar with cover crops and are now giving um, farmers good guidance on how to integrate cover crops. So um, that may be an opportunity for some of you to be that service provider, or if you, if you, you know, if you're thinking about how to use cover crops, maybe you need to, you know, ask your your current service provider for um, for more cover crop support. What it really boils down to is we have to think about what our object our objectives are, what we're trying to accomplish, and then we need to have realistic establishment options that align with those 
objectives. The most straightforward um, time frame for planting cover crops is after harvest, but that also is the the time that has the you know basically the least opportunity for growth. So we need to think through our possibilities and then come up with realistic establishment options. There are um, some good strategies for how to rearrange the puzzle pieces so that we can actually make cover crops fit in more effectively. This happens to be uh, a farmer in Indiana, Cameron Mills, who's thought about how to adjust his corn and soybean production to make cover crops fit in more effectively. I think um, because of limited time, we'll, we'll just move on. But the, the bottom line is we can choose earlier maturing cash crops. We can think about where on our farm we are likely to harvest the earliest and basically pick out the situations that are most likely to make our cover crops successful. In my experience, the system that probably um, has the biggest opportunity for increasing cover, the establishment system that has the biggest opportunity for increasing cover crop um, planting is using a vertical tillage tool where either we um, spin or blow on the seed before or while we are doing the vertical tillage. And so we're accomplishing multiple objectives. We're getting the seed out and we are um, sizing residues and shallowly incorporating the seed. Um, a tool like the one you see in this picture, you can plant 40, 50 acres per hour. That gets it done faster and also more cost effectively than using a drill. I think we'll just keep moving on here. Just to, to wrap us up today, let's think about two key objectives. One of the things that cover crops do that um, I think is maybe underappreciated is cover crops can help us reconnect our topsoil and our subsoil. That disconnection really interferes with access to subsoil moisture and nutrients, particularly subsoil moisture. So when when we grow cover crops effectively, we are reconnecting our topsoil and subsoil, and we're also helping to repair hydrologic function. I don't know if you've seen any of the um, rainfall simulator demonstrations, but wh whether you see it as a demonstration or you just simply go out in your fields during the rain, um, we, we know that we've been having more extreme rainfall events in the last decade, and if we can improve our connectivity between the topsoil and the subsoil, we will be repairing our hydrologic function, basically allowing water to move more quickly into our soils. So I think we're out of time. I guess the most critical question is, if you want to understand how to use cover crops effectively, you, you need to think about who is, who is the resource that you can reach out to that um, basically has proven how to use cover crops in your um, in your context or most similar context. So on the soils that you are working with and the cropping systems that you're working with, who are the people that have already solved some of those questions? And um, th those are the people that will be your most effective resources for answering questions about cover crops. Guys, I think uh, this, uh, Shows me that I'm a little rusty. I haven't given a lecture in about an, you know about a month, and I appreciate your your patience. Um, hopefully by next week when we get started at WIU, I'll be warmed up a little bit more. But thank you everybody, and if you have any questions, I'll take them at this time. All right, thank you, Dr. Groover. Great information. We do have uh, some some uh, questions. I'll just kind of read through some of these and allow you opportunity to uh to respond so the first one is can cover crops be utilized effectively in poorly drained central illinois soils where uh, it, it's challenging and ponds are uh, are developed okay good question um some of the most commonly used cover crop species like cereal rye and radish were two that i mentioned in this presentation perform poorly in those situations. They just simply are not very tolerant of wet feet. So what other alternatives are available? Well, annual ryegrass is probably the most tolerant of wetness. 
in terms of, in terms of the cover crop toolbox. So um, annual ryegrass is a cover crop that um, my plumber worked with extensively. It, you know, it is tried and true on a number of farms in Southern Illinois. Um, it, it has less of a track record in Central and Northern Illinois. It is, it's certainly much less winter hardy than cereal rye, but annual ryegrass is by far the most tolerant of wetness. And um, it, if you can get it planted here in, in Central or Western Illinois, I would say if you can get it planted before October 1st, and you have an annual ryegrass variety that is um, well adapted for winter hardiness, um, that there are you know, a number of those available. County would be an example. Um, you can have consistent overwintering and also um, consistent growth in wet soils. So I, I think there are opportunities, but we need to we, we need to be targeted about which species we select to grow in our wet soils. No, great response. <clears throat> Question number two, can cover crops be, be a profitable practice to controlling weeds and soybeans? Okay, so that, that's a great question. Um, basically the, the, the critical, issue with controlling weeds is you have to grow more cover crop biomass. And so you need to let your cover crops grow longer. This has been looked at really um, intensively by farmers in Iowa in the Practical, Practical Farmers of Iowa Cooperator Group. They've looked at this um, over a number of years. And basically what they found is if, if you let your cereal rye grow um, even a few weeks longer, you will substantially increase the weed suppression. And so um, that, you know, they've looked at this and what they, what they find is that um, soybeans can be effectively planted all the way, you know, all the way into uh, the, you know, the, the pollination stage of, of cereal rye with, with, with very limited um, negative effect on on the soybeans and much larger effect on wheat suppression if, if you let the, the cereal rye get that big. So um, mo most of the practical farmers of Iowa cooperators are now planting green. They're planting into living cereal rye and many of them are actually letting it get all the way to the, the boot stage or even all the way to pollination. The, the, the main concern with pollen, letting it get to pollination is that if you have all that pollen being released while you're driving through the field, you, you can actually plug up your radiator. But the, 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 the more cereal rye biomass you grow, the, the more weed suppression you will get. And um, you, basically you can, you can eliminate um, in many cases, at least one of your herbicide applications um, if, you, if you allow your cereal rye to, to grow to the boot stage or later. Oh, great. Third question, is broadcasting rye a good enough uh, cover crop establishment for soybeans? Okay. Um, rye, rye is one of the toughest cover crop there is. It, it can establish in, um, in you know, many different environmental conditions, all, all the way up to even after Thanksgiving. Um, but if you want to get, I guess, if you want to reduce your your risk of, of having environmental conditions that um, limit establishment, you, you should think about broadcasting and then doing a very shallow incorporation with a vertical tillage tool. Um, if, if you broadcast into corn stalks and you have favorable weather, um, cereal rye can establish very well. Um, but if, if you have, you know, if you have extended dry conditions, just a little bit of scratching that rye into the soil will um, increase the establishment and also will allow you to reduce your seeding rate. So that many of the farmers that are either using a drill or are using a vertical tillage tool to increase soil seed contact are, are planting very low rates of cereal rye, 40 pounds or less per acre. Whereas if you're just, if you're just aerial seeding or 
blowing, blowing or spinning it on without any incorporation, then um, most farmers are using at least a bushel of rye. Uh, one last question, Dr. Gruber, before we uh, uh, conclude. Uh, what was the yield response during the uh, the solar uh, corridors projects? Great question. Um, so the the basic idea with with solar corridors is that you are keeping your you're maintaining the corn population, but you are simply reducing the number of rows. So. You know, one example would be 60 inch row corn where you're taking two rows and condensing them into one. That's a situation where you really need to have a well adapted corn hybrid to make that work. But um, it's interesting there there are corn genetics that respond well to that. I was just looking at some data um, yesterday and um, there are corn hybrids that have very high flex that actually yield higher when planted on these wide rows as compared to our, our standard 30 inch rows. But that takes a very specific corn hybrid. You can reduce some of that risk if you use a system where, for example, you might have two rows of corn and then one skip, or three rows of corn and then one skip, or four rows of corn and then one skip. So if if you reduce the um, the, I guess the, um, the stress on the corn of being planted really close together, you can find more corn hybrids that will fit the system. And, um, I guess the, the bottom line is that with the, with the right corn hybrid, you can have very little, if any negative effect on corn yield and dramatic increases in cover crop biomass production. What, what we've seen consistently is we often have more than 10 times as much cover crop biomass grown in the solar corridors. We, we have seen a range of yield losses from about 5% up to about 20%. So I don't think we, we have found the right corn hybrids yet. Um, we're also doing it in an organic context where we may not be supplying enough fertility. Um, when, when you have corn plants that are only three inches apart, as you would if you were doing, you know, a 30,000 population in 60 inch rows, um, you, you need to have a little more fertility available is my interpretation. And I'm not, I'm not sure we've always provided that, but I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, moving, um, moving into, I guess, kind of next levels of this system in future years where we ma manage the, um, the genetics and the nutrients specifically for um, solar corridors and basically optimize corn and cover crop production at the same time. I, I think there are real possibilities. We've, we've seen the biomass production in the cover crops and I, I feel like we see how to uh, keep the corn yields up. But we, uh, on, on the WIU Organic Research Farm, we, we still have seen a yield hit in the last three years. Thank you, Dr. Groover. Uh, well, this will conclude the webinar of Managing Cover Crops for Modern Production Systems. Please take a few minutes to, after the, the webinar to answer our post-event survey. You can view the recording of this presentation and others on the Checkoff Funded website, illsoyadvisor.com. And thank you for attending the event and have a great day. Thanks, guys.